Hi everyone, welcome to your lecture on culture. This will be split into two different parts, and today we'll start looking at the basic elements of culture. What is culture? Well, let's start with a definition. Culture refers to beliefs. Beliefs could be your belief in a higher power or religion, or your belief that everyone has the right to have a belief. It could be your value systems, the fact that we value personal space or freedom of speech, behaviors and material objects, the behaviors could be the fact that we expect a 40-hour work week or that we expect people to graduate from high school and at some point get married and have children. And material objects, well, that could be the house that you live in, the car that you drive, the cell phone in your pocket, or the clothes that you wear. But put these all together and they may start to form our way of life. And often we pass these things on from generation to generation. Some of it's tradition and some of it's the here and now. So how would you define your culture? What is it to be part of an American culture? We look at two basic components. We look at non-material culture, things that are intangible, but they're still created by our society, and material culture, the tangible products that we can physically put our hands on. Something like music would be considered non-material. I understand that you can possess the instrument or you could buy the downloaded song, but it's essentially the concept, the idea, the creation that really isn't something physically that could be held. Or you could look at something like religion, that every society has its own practices and its own beliefs. We can't necessarily own or possess them. Where material culture is much easier. When we talk of material culture, we are talking of the physical items that we have. Culture helps explain human social behavior, whether we're talking about our beliefs, our values, or what we would consider norms. And norms are just the normal behavior, the expected behavior that we have. They help provide blueprints to guide relationships with other people. Imagine if you would, you're walking down the street and another person is walking towards you. You make eye contact. As an American, how would you behave? Well, for us, we start very early on instructing our children to smile politely, possibly say, good morning, good evening, how are you? Or even just give a polite nod. Not every culture has that same blueprint, but we tend to perpetuate it and teach our children and expect that they will then teach their children. Culture is not the same as society. You can have a multicultural society, but you're not going to have a multi-societal culture. Society is a group of people who live in a defined territory and participate in a common culture. Well, think about it this way. There are 50 states in the United States, 48 in the direct continental United States. You could argue that there is Southern culture, that there's a mid-Atlantic culture, there's a Midwestern culture, maybe there's uh, an Eastern culture and a Western culture, but ultimately, geographically, you can assume that different areas may have kind of specific traits that are unique to themselves. However, whether you're talking about an individual state or a region, we also agree that there is a dominant unifying American culture. If we're talking about culture, we also have to talk about heredity or essentially the nature nurture debate. Are you you because of the environment that you grew up in, your culture, or are there certain things about you that are basically written into your DNA? Are you incredibly instinctual? Well, what do humans do by instinct? The answer really is not a whole lot. We're not heavily instinctual animals, and in fact, culture is the thing that has allowed us to survive our reliance on each other and our ability to live together and to take invention, creation, stories of the past, learn from them and improve. Instincts are inherited patterns of behavior. We're not talking about reflexes like closing your eye when something gets thrown at your face or flinching when something hurts. We're talking about do you find your mate on instinct? Do you parent on instinct? Do you instinctually find food? And the answer is not really. Because if all of that were true, parenting, shelter, food, mating, everything everywhere would be the exact same. In the United States, 
we expect teenagers to date, to have different kind of romantic relationship experiences, and then usually in their 20s, settle down and get married. In other cultures, things like arranged marriages are the cultural norm, while they're not necessarily the norm here in the United States. If something was instinctual, we would never talk about those variations. So does heredity affect your behavior? Culture is your nurture, heredity is your nature. Well, the answer is that they do work hand in hand. Things like intelligence and personality traits are really influenced quite heavily by our genetics, but our environment also allows us to express some of those things. Heredity does not determine behavior, but it does set up some of the boundaries for it. So if you have an incredibly outgoing personality and you're put into an environment that supports that, then you may see that flourish. Where if you have an incredibly outgoing personality, but you're in a culture that doesn't prize individual excellence, then maybe that wouldn't flourish. Other terms that you should know that are related to this, reflexes. These are biologically inherited automatic reactions to an external or a physical stimuli. So like I said, if I were to throw something directly at your face and you couldn't block it with your hands, chances are you would flinch or close your eyes. If I take a bright light and flash it in your eye, your pupil will constrict. A reflex is an automatic programmed reaction. We have no choice in it. There's also something called a drive. If you've been outside working in the heat, you may feel a discomfort, you may feel thirst. You may then want to reduce that thirst and we would call that a drive. You have a drive to reduce the discomfort. So you are thirsty, you're gonna go get a glass of water. So what effect does nature have on nurture or vice versa? Well, again, they really do work hand in hand. Drives, reflexes, instincts, even our genetics set us up a certain way but our environment either lets us express things or it changes how we deal with them. Sociobiology looks at the study between how biology and human behavior interact, essentially how biology influences our behavior. It's built heavily off of the idea of natural selection, that any beneficial behaviors would continue to survive in a society and anything that would be non-beneficial would perish. Unfortunately, this has been used to support or try to justify racial superiority. And ultimately, there's way too much variation in societies to attribute to genetics alone. In fact, a lot of what we talk about often has more to do with environment and culture and things that humans create than truly our genetics. Humans are unique. Humans are the only species or animal that depend on culture rather than instincts to ensure survival. We're not particularly strong. We're not particularly fast. We don't have razor sharp teeth or incredibly strong nails. What humans have is the ability to think. But again, other animals can be quite clever as well. Not only do we think, but we can think about the future. Not only do we think about the future, but we can pass on what we know to our children. What you will never see is you teach your dog how to fetch and then your dog teaches another dog independently how to fetch. We can do something like develop a wheel or a simple tool and we can show one person how to make it and they can show thousands of people how to make it. Culture is a very recent development. However, it was a long time in the making. What sets humans apart from primates is our intelligence. Our achievements during the Stone Age literally sent us off on a different evolutionary course, and culture is our primary survival strategy. Watch any good zombie film or any apocalypse film. The thing that always kind of comes to the heart of it is people seeking out other people for survival. Our ability to survive has everything to do with our ability to create, to make, to build, and to transmit knowledge to others and work together. When talking about culture, it is important to understand that even though we're very familiar with and very comfortable with our own personal culture, that doesn't necessarily translate to being comfortable or understanding of other cultures. 
even the most open-minded person can experience culture shock. Go to a different culture and feel a sense of disorientation or discomfort because you're unfamiliar with the way that they live. We'll spend a little bit of time in class talking about culture shock and if you've ever experienced it and under what circumstances. I like the cartoon below because for us, we go to the zoo to see animals that we wouldn't normally see here in the United States. We're not overly wowed at seeing a prairie dog or maybe even sometimes a buffalo. Definitely not a cow or a goat or anything that you would normally see at a petting zoo or as you're driving through Fauquier County. We want to see lions and tigers and pandas. It's not to say that if you were to go to another country that you would experience something radically different. But what is familiar and normal for us may not always be familiar and normal for others. We'll talk about five common components that are necessary for culture. The first one being symbols, then language, values and beliefs, norms, and material culture to include technology. Looking at the two symbols below, which one means luck? Well, it depends on who you are and what experiences you have, but most Americans would see the four-leaf clover and understand that as a symbol of luck. And that's because pretty much every school everywhere celebrates St. Patrick's Day. Now, yes, that is a Roman Catholic Irish holiday, and it's actually a religious holiday. But in the United States, Irish Americans, myself being one of them, we don't necessarily celebrate it as a religious holiday. We celebrate it as kind of almost like an Irish heritage, Irish pride day. So most kids will wear a pinch me, I'm Irish, kiss me, I'm Irish, some form of green on March 17th and we'll let people know that we have an Irish heritage or we come from an Irish background. And the four leaf clover is a big symbol of that. So in most elementary schools, you would have seen shamrocks and four leaf clovers decorating the halls in March. Maybe not so much with lucky kitty or lucky cat. This is a Chinese good luck symbol. Symbols are anything that carry a particular meaning recognized by people who share a culture. Well, if you see someone find a four-leaf clover, they'll say it's good luck, like finding a penny, or maybe even having a rabbit's foot. We don't always know where those symbols come from, but if the culture embraces it and shares the meaning, it becomes part of that culture. The meaning of symbols vary from society to society, and they can even vary within a single society and over time. You guys have developed an entire system of symbols, and maybe even the generation that slightly predates you. You guys talk very effectively in symbolic language, and I don't mean letters, I mean emojis. You guys have constructed an entire system of symbols to allow you to communicate. We'll spend a little bit of time in class looking at how symbols can be misinterpreted. Here you're looking at the 1980s everything's okay sign here in the United States. And I don't really think anyone makes it anymore. That's usually the symbol that people make and if they put it below their waist, you have to slap yourself in the back of the neck. But that's that symbol being reappropriated into a game. In Russia, that symbol means that you're telling someone there is zero. In Brazil, it's an insult. In Japan, it's a symbol for money. Symbols are not universal. They're culturally bound. Language is a key element of culture. It allows us to transmit information from one generation to the next especially very culturally significant information. It could be value systems, beliefs, technology, or just stories that allow us to understand where we come from and who we are. Through most of human history, cultural transmission has been accomplished through oral tradition, through storytelling. Now, yes, you will sit and read a written document in a history class that tells you about American history but many of you have a family history and you hear stories about your grandparents and maybe even your great grandparents from family members. That becomes part of your understanding of your American history. Only humans can create complex systems of symbols. Other animals do have the ability to communicate, but they don't have what is technically language. And here's how you know. 
Animals can communicate important messages like where food is, when danger is approaching, or where a possible mate might be located. They can communicate it through body movement, sounds, um, dance, all sorts of different ways, and we've even been able to teach vocabulary to certain primates. The one thing we cannot get animals to do is to think in a metaphorical way. We can't get animals to guess about the future or even to quite understand the concept of future. We see the world in things like what ifs and possibilities and we can combine ideas that never exist in our world just through the use of language. We're the only species that can do that. There is a theory that you guys need to know which is called the sapphire wharf thesis or more commonly known as the hypothesis of linguistic relativity. The easiest way to understand this is language is relative. In other words, if something is relative, it's important to what its relation is. Language is relative to its culture. So if you live in a culture and you have many words for something, that is your culture's way of saying how important that thing is. The choice of words that a culture may use shows how important or unimportant something is. So with linguistic relativity, the more important an object is, the more important an idea is, the more important something is, the more words or ways to talk about it would be evident within that society. Benjamin Worf is the person who created the linguistic relativity hypothesis or the hypothesis of linguistic relativity. And we see this very evident in a group of people called the Red People from Namibia. As you see in the picture above, there is a circle of squares and one is blue and the rest are green. Well, here in America, color is really important. I went to Lowe's to pick out a color to paint my bathroom and I wanted to paint it gray. And I didn't just pick the color gray, I had to look through 30 different variants of the color gray. And some were a tan gray and some were more of a blue gray. And if you've ever gotten your nails done, picking a nail color or if you've ever gone and looked at a car and noticed that there's six different ways that you could describe navy blue or midnight blue or steel gray or gunmetal gray or and you start to see that we're heavily reliant on these varieties of color. Well this culture in Namibia has three colors. They have no access to modern technology they live essentially in rounded huts, they work the land, and they are very limited in their interaction with modern kind of people and technology. They don't need a gunmetal gray car or fingernails that are maybe lemon yellow. They understand that there's a variety of colors, but when they talk or when they describe things, they only need three. So, Researchers came and asked them, which color in this picture is different? Well, there's a problem. In their language, green and blue are the same label. They don't differentiate. And it took, on average, about 20 minutes for the people to try to really understand what the question was asking. When asked what color they saw, they reported it they had to figure out what it was that they were looking for. For them, greens and blues are part of nature, they fall under the same category. The question itself didn't make sense within the context of their culture. Have you ever been asked for a translation and been told that it doesn't really work or another culture's way of saying something doesn't work in English, but that they have this idea, this mindset, this thought, and they have a term that kind of encapsulates it? By learning something like that, exposure to other languages or other ways of thinking, we can alter the way that we perceive the world, or at least broaden our horizons and start to understand the world differently. Exposure changes the terms we use to think about the world, and people that are bilingual have this kind of double ability to see the world in really kind of two vantage points, through two different lenses, through whatever their primary language is and maybe even their secondary language. How many of you have heard the story of the Nasarema? Some of you may have, and I would assume many of you haven't. If you were to write Nasarema backwards, 
you would get the story of the American. This was a story that was constructed by Horace Minor. He created what's called an ethnography and he described American behavior to a bunch of people as if he were reporting a foreign culture or an alien planet and he looked at our behaviors from an outsider's perspective. Things like going to the bathroom to brush your teeth, something that we would consider a very normal daily habit, he was able to transform into looking at someone going into a room covered in porcelain tiles that indicated the extravagance of the home. And the more of these rooms that had these, you know, huge walls of porcelain, the more important the home was. And you would go in there and you would pick up a wooden implement that was filled with hog's hair bristles and you would pour a magical potion on it and you would use it to extract things from your teeth. Well, it's a really kind of intense way of talking about an old timey toothbrush and toothpaste. But if you think about some of the behaviors we do, he even went into talking about medicine cabinets and how we have to go to special witch doctors and they write in an imaginary script that no one else understands before they can get us these kind of potions that will cure all of our ills and that we never throw the potions away and that we kind of collect and hoard them even when they no longer serve their value. And then you go, how many of us have that drawer in our house of expired medication that we haven't thrown out? Any culture, if looked at from an outsider perspective, can always seem weird. So looking at things from an outsider's perspective, as an American, what are our values? Well, it's really easy to start out with anything that was stated in the Bill of Rights. Values are culturally defined standards for which we judge what's desirable, what's good, what's beautiful, and it's a very large, broad guideline for social living. Values are very broad principles. Things like f we value freedom of speech, we value equality, and beliefs, well, they're a bit more specific statements that people hold to be true. Beliefs are ideas that are about the nature of reality, and beliefs can be true or false. You can believe something that isn't in fact correct, but again, beliefs, much like values, are hard to change. Robin Williams was a sociologist who identified 10 key values of U.S. culture in the 1900s. He said the first thing that Americans value is equal opportunity. That if a job is posted, if a team is looking to do tryouts, if somebody wants to join uh, an orchestra, that everyone who is qualified should have the same opportunity to try out that we value achievement and success and that often this is going to equate to what we consider personal worth. So people with higher paying jobs are valued or held at a higher level of esteem in our country. Well, it's hard to refute that when we think about the fact that actors and athletes are held in a very high level of esteem. They play games and pretend to be other people for a living, but they have achievement and success. Material comfort. The average American, if you think about it, most families, average Americans, have more than one car. Most people in America have more than three sets of clothing and one pair of shoes. And in fact, if you were to kind of take a mental lap through your house, do you have the bare necessities or do you have things that make life just a bit more comfortable? We value activity and work. We live in a society that unemployment or people who choose not to work, it's frowned upon. And that getting a promotion or being elevated to a higher job is often what we expect people to do while they're at work. We like practicality and efficiency. So this goes back to Weber, but we like rational, we like faster. Think about standing in line at a fast food restaurant for more than five minutes and you're angry about how slow the line goes. We want things to be efficient. We want things to be practical. We want our computers to work fast. We want our internet to work faster. As a culture, we like progress and we like science. Think of the newest iPhone coming out or the idea of self-driving cars. We like equality. Now, this one may be something that is a deeper conversation to have later, 
But for the most part, we still expect our country to be a country of equals. Regardless of any other qualifying factor, we expect people to be treated as individuals and that those individuals are in fact equal, regardless of race or gender, religion, or any other qualifier. We believe that our society should be a democracy, that under the law, all people should have equal rights, and we have the right to elect our government. He believed that as a society, we also value freedom. And then he also said, strangely enough, that we value group superiority. And that's still very true. Whether you're talking about people grouping themselves together by neighborhood or job or religious affiliation, social class, we find people who are like us and we often try to make ourselves the better group. You guys do this when you talk about the high schools. Which is the better high school? Well, of course, it has to be Cattle Run. That's where you go. And when you start to look at it, you've already determined different ideas about the other high schools. Now, whether those are true or not, it makes you feel like the group that you belong to is somehow better, more important. That is something that Americans value. Our teams, our groups, our kind of collectives, neighborhoods versus schools versus, and you start to see that to a certain degree, we want to be part of the winning team. Values within a society can actually be inconsistent and sometimes even opposed to one another. Some sociologists believe that this list is incomplete and values like optimism and honesty and even friendliness should be added to complete it. Now it's up to you guys to decide whether or not there are other values that are missing or that should be added or maybe even omitted. Values are important to all cultures, but they do differ when we look at the type of countries that we're talking about. Values that are important to higher income countries can actually differ from that in lower income countries. One such example would be the culture of victimization that we have in the United States, the don't blame me culture, the it's not my fault because culture, it's somebody else's responsibility culture. That's not to say it's only a millennial thing. That's to say that as a country, we're becoming increasingly unwilling to accept personal responsibility, especially for individuals and their failings and misfortunes. Where we see this really heightened is when we start looking at how often people sue Many of you guys have heard of the McDonald's coffee case. And if you haven't, most people know of it as a woman spilled hot coffee in her lap and she sued McDonald's for millions and millions of dollars. And people read the headline and they said, well, of course, coffee is hot. This is ridiculous. This is a frivolous lawsuit. Well, we do have a huge number of people that sue for absolutely ridiculous reasons. But just to make sure that we clear the air, the McDonald's coffee case wasn't frivolous. Most people have heard of this, but what most people don't know is that McDonald's was serving their coffee at 180 to 190 degrees, and this is hot enough to cause third degree burns. In other words, hot enough to melt your skin. They received 700 claims for serious injuries, and they continued to serve it at this really high temperature because they didn't want to deal with people complaining about their coffee being too cold. Well, what happened was a 79-year-old woman, Stella Liebach, was getting into her car, and if you guys kind of think about getting into a car without cup holders, she sat down and she placed her coffee between her legs to put on her seatbelt. Well, the lid of the coffee popped off, and if it had been hot coffee, there may have been some minor first-degree burns, you know, the reddening of the skin. But what ended up happening was she ended up having very serious third-degree burns, and it required her to have eight days of hospitalization and then multiple surgeries and skin grafts, she only was asking for McDonald's to pay her medical bill. They refused, she sued, and instead of getting millions of dollars, she got her medical bills covered, which we agree probably is the right thing to have happened, especially since McDonald's knew what they were doing was harmful to people. When we talk about value systems within our society, we have to be very careful that we not only just talk about them, but we investigate where they come from and also how that can affect the dialogue and the narrative that we talk about. All right, so next week we will have part two of culture and we will look at things like norms and a couple of other 
important concepts that will continue this discussion.